Um, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Malva Kajali, the events assistant here at The Rail, and I'm so excited to be your MC today for a conversation that emerges out of our September critics page, in which I'm fairly confident will be the September critics page come to life, curated um, by the fabulous Dr. Elizabeth Bishop and featuring the illustrious Regina Anderson, Damaris Dunn, Nicole Hamilton, and Yolanda Seely Ruiz. This magnificent group of humans will be in conversation with our very own Nick Bennett. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. I also would like to highlight that the state of New York is currently engaged in a baseless lawsuit against the Shinnecock Nation, and I'll drop a link in the chat if you want to learn more and contribute to their cause. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings unfolding in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Emma Arbery, Richard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., Casey Goodson and countless others. We have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. Um, obviously this list is not like an authoritative comprehensive list, but it's been also something to watch how over the past eight or nine months, um, just in terms of our own archive, the list has grown. We acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until black lives matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host, Nick Bennett is the special projects editor and my comrade here at the Brooklyn Rail. Nick, passing the microphone over to you. Thank you, comrade Malvika. Um, I just wanna share how happy and grateful I am to be here today and to be hosting this conversation. Um, I wanna start off very quickly with an introduction to Dr. Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, Bishop is a writer, researcher, professor, youth advocate, Nietzschean and surf monk. Bishop is the author of two books, Becoming Activist and Embodying Theory. She lives in Brooklyn with her dog, Messi. So welcome, Bishop. It is wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, nothing makes me happier than to see all the people coming into this virtual environment. All these folks that I didn't even know were going to be here today just popping up. So it's making, it's like filling my heart. Yes, it's like a it's like a family event here today at the rail. Um, I, I just want to say a few, a few words on the critics page before we jump right into the conversation. And um, for anyone that hasn't read it yet, we'll post a link in the chat. But here at the Brooklyn Rail every month, we invite a guest to essentially curate a section in our, in our publication, both in print and online, on uh, any topic that's kind of on their mind or that they're thinking about. And they have full autonomy to, to write to their friends and write to their colleagues and to, to put together this, this critics page. And if you haven't read the September one titled World on Fire, I highly suggest you do. And I want to say it's a beautiful, moving, powerful collection of writings that makes you either want to just start writing poetry or take the energy to the streets. So uh, I wanna thank you all again. And I wanna thank our audience for being here and that we get to add this to our arch archive of these talks. Um, so I want to uh, pass the mic to you, Bishop, to introduce today's guests because you go way back with them. And as the, your text says, you know, let's, uh, let's get the party started. Word, let's get the party started. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm able to highlight four of the contributors. You know, we had a, almost a dozen folks participate in this. And so I'm uplifting um, today four of those individuals and I'm gonna go ahead and name them right now um, and say what's up to those folks. And then, and then I'm gonna throw some James Baldwin into the mix. 
uh, before I throw it back to you, Nick, for whatever kind of question you want to, to open it up. So um, I did choose to kind of at least introduce this whole thing in the same order that we published. Um, and even when we go and kind of throw the mic to the contributors, we'll do the same. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Yolanda Steely Ruiz. Shout out Yoli. Um, what up Yoli, love from the Vortex. So uh, Yolanda is uh, an award-winning professor at Teachers College, Columbia University, who I had a great pleasure of meeting uh, like over a decade ago, probably. And uh, the day I met her, she told me that we were soul sisters because we both knew that the university was a pimp. That's how we met. <laughs> Yoli, so much love. Thank you for being here. Um, and I'm just gonna pivot right through so that we get everybody's faces up, up on the screen. So Damaris Dunn, D, Miss Damaris Dunn, soon to be Dr. Dunn, um, is a native New Yorker and an educator, is currently doing a doctorate at University of Georgia uh, at the Mary Frances Early College of Education. And her research is on anti-blackness and black girl joy. What's up, D? So good to see you. Um, Damaris and I go back, we've worked together, we stand in solidarity together, we educate together, um, we're gonna raise some hell together uh, as the day goes on. So I'm so glad that you're here, D. Um, and then my friend, Nicole Hamilton, who is a fierce radical educator, um, trainer, curriculum writer, youth worker, all the damn things, Nicole does all the things. Um, and Nicole and I go back to, to our CUNY world, uh, but we've gone way beyond that um, since then. So Nick, I'm so happy that you're here, um, you are like, you blew me away with what you brought to this project. So I'm, I can't wait to pass you the mic. Um, and last but never least is uh, my, my true sister in the struggle, my, my best friend, uh, Regina Anderson. So Regina um, is many things to me. Um, she is my sister, she is my family. Um, and she also happens to be a bad bitch and part of me, but I said it. Um, so. You, uh, Regina is the executive director of the Food Recovery Network, and that work is absolutely extraordinary, and I encourage you to check that out. Um, and she's also a hybrid socialist who's here to do work in the community uh, and to crack open what needs to be cracked open to build community. So, um, you know, one thing I'll say is Regina and I met, I don't know, 15 years ago at Carnegie Mellon University, it was a long time ago. And back then, my young self was talking about ethics and aesthetics, and Regina was like, how about you talk about economics ever? So we do that now. We talk about ethics, aesthetics, and economics all the damn time. Um, I couldn't be happier to have all of you here. I love all of you. Um, thank you for your presence. And real quick, I'm gonna. I just wanna. I wanna uplift um, the man of all time, James Baldwin. So last night when I couldn't sleep because I was amped about this conversation, I, I re-picked up Conversations with James Baldwin, and then I also re-picked up Eddie Glaude Jr.'s new book um, called Begin Again about what we can learn from Baldwin for today. Yeah, there it is, Yoli. Why don't you just pick it up off your desk? So um, three tiny quotes, three tiny quotes that are about struggle, about love, and about repair. I'll keep it quick, and I'll send it back to Nick. First on struggle, in 1963, James Baldwin said, you must understand that your pain is trivial, except insofar as you use it to connect with other people's pain. And insofar as you can do that with your pain, you can be released from it. And then hopefully it works the other way around. In so far as I tell you what it is to suffer, perhaps I can help you to suffer less. So I really wanted to ground this in the fact that when we, when we created this, there was pain, there is pain. We are living an unprecedented catastrophic moment. And so I, I wanna uplift the pain and the struggle and the solidarity that comes from that and the need for critical love. Yoli, critical love is a thing that Yolanda, C, Dr. Yolanda C. Ruiz talks about all the damn time. And here's Baldwin in 1969 talking about love. If only people could trust that thing, they would be less afraid of being touched, less afraid of loving each other, less afraid of being changed by each other. Life would be different. Our children would not be the victims that they are now. We would not be either. But for some reason, love is the most frightful thing something that the human being is in most need of and dreads the most. And then when I think about love and the emphasis on love, love is the answer and we need repair. So lastly, 
here's Baldwin on the idea of repair. I want there to be repair in this country, not just for communities of color that have been victimized by bigotry and discrimination, but for all of us. I don't think we can get free until we are willing to tell the truth about our history. I believe in truth and reconciliation. I think they are sequential. You can't have reconciliation without the truth. So I'm uplifting all of this because we're here to speak the truth to power. And we're, we're here to talk about love and to center love and not be afraid to use the word love. So I love all of you. Thank you, Fong, Charlie, Nick, Mavica, JC, Jeremy, Juliet, everybody at the rail. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Nick. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks for setting the stage with some Bishop, or sorry, with some Baldwin. Uh, and a, and a, a shout out to Lisa Dunn in the chat who also made it into the uh, critics page in her own right. Um, so I wanna start off by uh, an observation and kind of roll into a question. Um, here we are in December, 2020. And you know, in December, I feel like a lot of us tend to begin to look at the year in retrospect. Um, naturally, 2020 has been a year that's going to carry a very distinct memory for all of us and um, in sorry, in, in individual memories, but in collective memories as well. And it, it was interesting to reread all of these texts with that sort of retrospective mentality um, because it kind of naturally leads you to thinking of the year to come and what that will bring and, and what will bring to it. Um, so starting off with Bishop's text titled World on Fire, it reads like a manifesto of uplifting vitalism and radiant survival, which are their phrases. And, uh, and in it, in Bishop, you use the phrase installation as party as mode of survival. And I see uh, today as sort of a virtual installation, which is you know, an extension from the, that printed page and from that September issue. And I'm, I'm really happy that the, the rail is this platform for discussion where we can feature all of these voices today. So my question for you, Bush, Bishop, is a very practical one to start with, uh, the genesis of all of this. So when you were approached earlier this year to join as one of our guest critics, uh, what was going through your mind at the moment and what inspired you to approach your critics page the way you did? Um, kind of like, what were you reading? What were you thinking? What were you marching on? Uh, because it's, again, been quite the year. What was I reading? I mean, everything all the time, kind of. I don't even know how to answer that question. Um, I was so supremely humbled when Fong approached me. I was at the Occupy Colby party actually that evening um, and felt like I had no business being asked to do this and then full capacity to bring in all of the illest people I know. Um, and the first thing I did was start dropping text messages to all the fierce people who are here, who are being highlighted today, um, as well as a handful of other folks that are also, some of whom are here in ob observance of this event. Um, but you know, I think, I, it, I knew we couldn't have a party in person by the time it was time to do this. And that kind of broke my heart because, um, you know, the vitalism, I mean, this all comes from Nietzsche for me, frankly, um, and it kind of always starts and ends somehow with Friedrich Nietzsche in terms of like um, living life in this world now versus, you know, waiting for the next life. And all the people that I, I brought into this conversation, that's what they do. They like center life in the now and uplift people in the now. So, um, you know, I think we were, in, I was in quarantine. I was at Playa Quarantina here in Brooklyn um, in my backyard trying to make some sense of what was happening. And the one thing I knew, the organizing principles and their reference early in the, in the World of Fire piece was that I was anti-racist, anti-fascist, anti-corporate capitalist surveillance. So um, to be a you know, white credentialed kid from Connecticut and be offered this space, the first thing I wanted to do is pass a mic and to ensure that we were uplifting um, you know, we're most of us are educators. So many of the people that I brought to this conversation are fierce critical pedagogues and educators. So what does it mean to center anti-racist pedagogy and practice anywhere in any, in any community space? That anti-fascist, because there was a fascist in the White House, is still a fascist in the White House, don't trip. And then anti-corporate capitalist surveillance, all these people know I talk to them on Signal, catch me at Proton Mail, 
be careful. Know that, know that they, they're here for you, right? They're, they're coming for you. So what does it mean to push back, essentially? And, you know, one thing that somebody said to me, Carolyn Eanes, who's in the piece with me, um, she said, find your pillars of wellness. And I feel like so much of what this was about was about finding pillars of wellness. So it's kind of this idea of um, uh, where, where wellness meets punk meets survival. Um, and, and so that's, you know, all I could do is pass the mic to the people I knew best um, who could spit it better than I ever could in, in this particular environment on the page and now today uh, um, on the mic. So why don't we just jump right in then uh, with our first contributor, if you want to uh, pass that mic. Yeah. So um, my, my dear friend, Yolanda C. The Ruiz, I, you know, I got the hard copy in my hands. Pandemic Poetics, a Eulogy and Manifesto in an Anti-Black World, which she did with Gwen, Dr. Gwendolyn Baxley as well. Yoli, you got the mic. Let's go. <laughs> Wait, you on, you on mute, my love. Let's go. You're not on mute. What happened? You need to come hey, in Hey, can you hear hey. me? Thank you for passing the mic. Bishop, listen, I could spend my time saying how much I love you, how much you mean to me, and how grateful I am for this space. Uh, I want to thank Brooklyn Rail and specifically our dope MCs for the way of opening up this space and thank all of you for being here with us. I don't have much time, but let me just say that um, doing this piece with Dr. Gwen Baxley was a, um, I would say one of a life-changing moments for me because Gwen and I were also engaged in writing another piece about uh, black radical tradition. And we were being very steeped at that moment in uh, specific looking at poets, uh, June Jordan, Amir Baraka, you know, James Baldwin is always a poet uh, to me. Everything he writes is poetry. And so we were really digging deep. And then this invite came in from Bishop. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, the gods are really talking to me. And so I said, ben, Gwen, sis, how about being part of this as well? And so uh, it was just a magic moment. It was a moment uh, that we needed for healing. We turned, Gwen and I turned to poetry for healing. And what I wanna do is to use my time just to read two pieces, um, small stanzas from Gwen's Miss Rona and from my piece, American Dreams. And uh, if it is not more appropriate today, then I don't know when it is. As we think about brother Casey Gooden, who was gunned down as we are still in these pandemics and they're still snatching our bodies and our souls. And uh, I wanna give a shout out to ATN, Abolitionist Teaching Network here, Bettina Love, who is a North Star for me as is Goldie Muhammad. And so I wanna read these two pieces as I think about these brothers and sisters who are constantly, all of us under surveillance, some of our lives and our bodies that have been snatched by bringing in Sister Gwen's work and having her respond to me. So this is my attempt at call and response. American dreams. Here we go, y'all. Um, as America talks about humanity, theirs but not quite ours. Let's remember Brianna and Ahmad Trayvon and Sandra, Kayla and Tamir, Mother Eleanor and Brother Amadou, all shot down like rabbit dogs, angelic and black, mistaken for red and blue demons in white dreams. I will lift my pen and my voice to resist and persist in resistance and remember their innocence going about their daily lives, sitting, jogging, walking, driving, resting, working, and playing while black and blue and white reigned in terror, snatching breaths and quiet lives when no one and everyone looked on in silent amazement. And Gwen says in Miss Rona, don't you know I've died so many times before I've lost count? Don't know that you're merely a deja vu. I've been choked, been whipped, been shot, been got swine from your crooked cousin named Cop. We've been here before, boo. And I've always been birthed back anew because that's what black do. Don't you know I am lit? I am live, I am life. Even when you strip me of my last breath, I am spirit, I am sky. I am the fly cat with more than nine lives. I am the pulse of my people. I am the fist in the fight. I am the protest before the protest, before the protest. And I am still here, 
standing. How dare you try me? That's all I got to give right now, y'all. Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic to Sister Damaris because I am beginning, even in death and sadness, we have joy. We've also always had joy. This is how we're survived. This is how we're still here. And as with Sister Bettina Love and Sister Goldie Muhammad, Sister Damaris, you write about Black joy. And that was your piece in the rail. Yes. Uh, thank you for passing a mic, Yoli. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Um, my mom and my dad are here, uh, which is beautiful because I get to share this space with them. Thank you, Bishop. Um, so much of my journey has been about folks passing the mic and about folks um, really pouring into me and seeing me. Uh, and so getting to write about joy really comes um, on the heels of my advisor at, at the University of Georgia, Dr. Bettina Love. And, and she, you know, she gave me permission to write about joy. She's like, yeah, of course you can write about black joy. Why wouldn't you write about black joy? Um, and Bishop, the same. Uh, when I was thinking about writing this piece, I was like, can I, can I write about my experience with COVID? And Bishop was like, of course you can. Um, and you got this amount of words to do it. Um, and so I'm gonna read a piece from, uh, Black joy is not canceled. For exactly one month, COVID lived in my Black body. Petrified of the news and the many Black bodies that Rona took for ransom, I had to shut everything off from my sanity. As I tried to conjure up the strength to finish my first year in a PhD program, breathing difficult, loss of smell, and on and off fevers, I received strength from my community, the US Postal Service, and Amazon. Though Amazon operates within the confines of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, it was my only hope for receiving countless bottles of Fiji water, a humidifier, Mucinex, Vicks vapor tablets, zinc, elderberry, vitamin C, ice packs, Tylenol, peppermint oil, ginger tea, and anything else that Lisa Dunn, my mama, could send through the mail. Nevertheless, I, we prevailed. My community, be it old co co-workers, family members, classmates, and professors at my current institution were with me every step of the way. Some three swabs to the back of my nostrils and antibody tests later, I was reminded of how incredibly grateful I am to have been blessed with such amazing people in my life. Though the experience was painful, it was joy filled. Joy was in conversation with my Hollywood actor god brother who discouraged mucus producing foods. To this day, I remind him that he sent dirt through the mail for me to drink, but it helped. Joy was a good friend sitting on the hood of her car outside my door so I would not feel lonely. Joy was a bachelorette party via Zoom with my girls. Joy was still being able to attend class with my dynamic advisor and our after class check-ins to make sure I was okay. Joy was my little sister's playlist. I got up some days and danced to keep my lungs clear. Laying on my back was not advised. Joy was late night phone calls with my best friend after she worked tirelessly at a hospital. Joy was my lungs opening up every time I laugh via FaceTime. Joy was writing about black girls and the importance of access to an education that is steeped in history, healing and healthy relationships. Warrior poet Audre Lorde reminds us that the erotic is that which is deeply rooted. The erotic of joy is our core not something that we can that can be taken away, but something that we must tap into to survive and resist. While experiencing COVID, I had to dig deep to recalibrate and recenter myself. This black girl body found joy in all the pain and all the media coverage and all the fatality. As we continue to move through this pandemic, hypocrisy and plantation capitalism, we must know that black joy is not canceled and it is the same joy that has brought us thus far we have and always will resist. I'm a witness and a believer that joy will carry us all through. We will win because our joy is justice. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Miss Nicole. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, I'm just 
I don't even know what to say. I'm floored and honored to be here and to be a part of this um, panel. Thank you to Brooklyn Rail for making this possible and for just being a dope space. Um, thank you to everyone that's on this panel for your writing and your words of wisdom and just encouragement and joy. Uh, thank you to Bishop for just being Bishop <laughs> and always uh, putting me on blast and on the spot all the time. I'm always like, why is Bishop asking me to do this thing with these people? Like these people are so ridiculously amazing. And I'm always feeling like, why am I here in this space? And Bishop always reminds me that I too uh, deserve to be in places like this. So I really appreciate you for all of that. Um, as I'm looking here, I was sitting here like, what am I gonna read? I don't even know. Um, and I'm reading and looking at the original version of this thing that I wrote. And I don't even know how many words it was supposed to be, but I write a lot of words. And so mine was like 300 bazillion words over what it was supposed to be. Um, so I'm gonna read you a little bit of an excerpt um, from On Confinement, which I wrote. And I think in the time that I was um, writing this, we know we were and are still on lockdown, shut down, um, just coming out of uh, being in New York at a time where like 700 plus people were um, dying per day from COVID-19. Um, and that being the reality and watching that on the news daily, feeling literally like locked in, um, locked in your own home, locked in your own, on your block, locked in your own body, locked everywhere, just shut down. Um, and I just started to feel like, what would it be like to be, like, I'm glad I don't suffer from claustrophobia. Um, and I don't know what it would be like too, but uh, just feeling claustrophobic in that respect. So um, I'm gonna read a piece of this from the part past the part about confinement. Cause I, I don't know where I was going in my mind, but I was, writing about the middle passage and about bras that are too tight and shoes that are uncomfortable and all kinds of things. Um, but uh, I don't like to be confined. For those of those people who know me know, I'd, I like to always have a clear path out. Egress is important, comfortable clothes are important. I just like to be free. Um, so it reads here. Now is an interesting time in our world where everyone's freedom of all has been, where the freedom of all has been compromised. We are confined by the ever-present threat of a covert killer named COVID-19, contained, pinned down, restricted, hemmed in. Seeking solutions that elude us, we search for a cure, a vaccine, a stimulus, a way to eat in public and gather together, a way to return to school. We seek a safety that is not yet readily available to us. And so some rebel like spoiled teenagers, ignoring the signs and science where others retreat like recluses and become detached from reality yet others still use their carte blanche to carpe diem for the reclaiming of their freedom, for they recognize that it is in this chrysalis of crisis that we are giving way to something else entirely. We are in the midst of a revolution and the transformation of our nation is once again at hand. The cobwebs are being cleared as we awaken from a rest restless, fitful, drunken slumber. We struggle to dig ourselves out of our own graves, which have been dug deep by the plows of white domination, anti-Black violence and propaganda, misogyny and patriarchy. We push past the broken bodies of our fallen comrades who too often fell victim to the state sanctioned violence intended for us all. Us being us of a darker hue whose bodies blend with the soil from which we emerge. This is no easy feat. The struggle to break through has been the challenge of our lifetime for the soil is hard and compact and has been baking for centuries under the broil of the devil's sun. To puncture its crust takes the strength of millions and at its surface, a boot to kick us back down and a shovel to bury us alive again. Yet we call on the poetically prophetic wisdom of our ancestors and still like dust and air we rise. We rise to scream truth to power at the top of our lungs until in solidarity, we too cannot breathe. We rise to press reset on the reconstruction. We, we rise to rebuild greenwood and, re, and resurrect rosewood. We rise to till and to plant, to sow and to harvest our own goods that cannot be stolen, co-opted, gentrified or appropriated. We rise to emerge from the kitchen and take our seat at the table as we too sing America. We too sing America as we march toward Black Lives Matter Plaza in our nation's capital. We too sing America as we don white coats and enter labs to test, in, to test the incubators of innovation. 
We too sing America as we grope to find our way to the elusive moving target that is our ballot box. We too sing America as we are sworn, voted, and appointed into the rooms where our own fates have been sealed for generations. We break the seal every time. Those mysterious rooms are not just offices shaped like ovals, they are boardrooms, delivery rooms, classrooms, lecture halls, think tanks, and online chat spaces. These are the places that too have been out of reach for many of us. And since necessity is the mother of invention and we are the mother of all nations, of course, it is inherent with us, within us to build our own. Black at everything is as undefeated as the internet itself. And when we do choose to find ourselves in those mysterious rooms, it is imperative that we come equipped with the correct tools. Our artistic ancestors advise us that those tools of the oppressors we must never use for his tools are rendered useless in the dismantling of his own house, even if that house was built with our very own hands. So we must forge our own tools, chart our own course, find our own joy and set our own standards. We will not be confined. We will not be controlled. We will not conform. We will always resist, reclaim, engage, protest, remix, reinvest, redistribute, rebuild, read, write, vote, rebel, rest, recharge, reimagine, and repeat. And at the time of this, uh, our dear ancestor, John Lewis had recently passed and he said, uh, freedom is not a state, it is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take and each generation must do its part to create an ever more fair, more just society. Thank you. And I am passing the mic to Regina. Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks everyone so much. Um, I'm the one, you know, crying. <laughs> lots, of, um, lots of tears, lots of emotion. Um, and I just feel really, um, grateful that I can uh, be in a space where that is, it's okay. It's, it's totally normal. And we all have a lot of emotions that we're processing through. And the words that I've heard today have really um, inspired and sparked a lot of things for me to think about. Um, and, you know, one of the themes I think that um, I'm, I'm hearing and I want to, um, you know, keep holding up is, is this idea of conversation and as conversation means practice and that means we do it and we do it again and we do it again and we do it again and we try. So, so many of the thoughts that we're hearing from everyone today, this is part of our practice and it really asks us that we do this again later on today. We talk about what we've, what we've heard, we talk about the emotions that we've had. So there's so much opportunity for us. Um, I, I too needed to, um, just thank the, the Brooklyn Rail. Um, I was introduced to the rail because of Bishop and wow, my life really just got so enhanced because of my exposure to the rail. Um, and so, you know, I had an opportunity, the pleasure to meet Fong um, about a year ago now. Um, and, and to Nick, thank you so much for hosting, um, Melvika, Johnny, um, you're all such special people and Malvika in particular, I do also want to um, thank you for giving the space um, that too often is denied us um, to think about what land we're on, why we're on this land um, and the understanding that um, we're still getting killed, <laughs> you know, and we keep saying stop killing us and and it, it we're you know it's, i don't think it's necessarily falling on deaf ears in 2020 but it's still a flood um and that part of what the conversation that i had with bishop in my piece for the for the brooklyn rail um you know is is it's it's just it's around um i mean it's just around so many things and i'm actually not going to read from it because Though we talked about circular economy, um, that is one of the more nonlinear <laughs> pieces of writing that I think you could that you could find, and it's just an insight into the kinds of conversations that Bishop and I have. Um, and so I was very honored that um, you know Bishop wanted to just put onto paper some of the thinking that we have together. 
Um, and when I think about circular economy, there are so many things that came to my mind, including the shape of a circle. You know, that's, that's kind of one dimensional. But the other thing about, you know, circular is it doesn't necessarily mean that it's closed, you know. Um, circular can go in a lot of different directions. And so the conversation that, um, you know, we had was felt very physical to me um, around, you know, shapes and this idea of circular economy. Sometimes we think about arcs, the arc of history, the arc of justice, um, and that is very rooted in movement. And then when we think about economy, the conversation that Bishop and I had, um, you know, I was in a space of the first thing that we are steeped in is, is in capitalism. So we're steeped in capitalism, circular economy, um, it maybe makes us think about money as, as the exchange. And Bishop and I didn't even talk about that. You know, we, we talked about so many other exchanges and it was about relationships and economy is the asking of something, you know, that's, I have something, you have something, maybe we can exchange those things. That's an, that's an economy. Um, and uh, so I wanted to, to, to put that out to, to everyone when we think about where we are in this moment and some of the um, hardships that we have, the hardships that so many of us have had since we've you know, landed on, on uh, this particular plot of land, um, that, that it, 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 it takes on many, many, many forms. And in particular, um, what I also wanted to talk about was, um, you know, food within that economy. You know, when we think about capitalism society, it demands a lot of us. It is that physicalness. It demands, um, it does demand that we work, we use our bodies to work. Um, and for capitalism to be successful, it also demands that we systematically deny others housing. We deny others food. For us to have a successful capitalistic society, we have to deny others these, these things. And so Bishop and I talked about, you know, this idea of, of food is a right. It's not, it's not questionable. But what capitalism and this circular economy, this particular capitalistic circular economy, says to us is that we have to deny people food for everyone else to feel okay. And that we've been doing this for such a long time that people are born into a system where that just feels like a normal thing. Some people just don't have food. And everyone here at this conversation, you know, we say other things, we say other things. Um, we know that there is a different way to do this. And, you know, I, I think a lot in the future, I always say to my, to my team, when we think about food and we think about economies and we think about how to change things, I would say, I'm just gonna go into the future real quick, I'll BRB. <laughs> so, but how, how can we envision, you know, outside of a, 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 a capitalist society? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And so back to what Malvika was saying around, you know, the land and the earth, the water, what does it look like or what does that feel like that there's no monetary exchange for that? Capitalism says that we need to be afraid <laughs> of everyone having equal access to that. And so um, I want us to be here together to just think about, you know, what are the assumptions that we have to hold every day? because of capitalism to, to, to feel okay. Um, and I, I also wanted to really quickly, before I pass things back over um, to Dr. Bishop, um, what Damaris said about, uh, you know, black joy and, and that being resistance. When we think about um, capitalism, when we think about economy and on whose backs we've built, um, you know, this current system that we have, you know, Johns Hopkins University just recently, uh, yesterday said, oh, by the way, we forgot the person who helped found this, this institution owned slaves. Only four, only four, um, you know, and, and just that opening up of that conversation, that discomfort is really important to have that conversation that is part of, you know, when I said before an arc can take on many shapes. It can become a closed circle 
but there is that opportunity. Whatever Johns Hopkins has opened up, it's not closed yet. And so we got to get in there. <laughs> we got to highlight the things that, you know, what makes them uncomfortable. We got to highlight that. We got to keep that open until um, the healing can begin for, for more of us. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I know I didn't talk too much about food, but I just wanted to keep on with that, that economy and that, that circular physical feeling. So thank you all. Thanks so much. Back to you, Bishop. Soul food. Talking about soul food. Yeah. Talking about the damn food. <laughs> uh, I'm going to real quick, I'm going to read to all of you because I wanted to pass the mic early. I'm going to read the last three paragraphs of the introduction that I wrote. Um, and then we're going to throw the mic to Nick and, and everybody from the rail to open up for questions. And as Malvik has been saying in the chat, Q&A is wide open. So please drop questions. Um, so he, this was August 1st when I submitted this. Um, and here's what I said in the end of the last three paragraphs. <clears throat> This collection of writing and art is a defense against the violence in our lives, an affirmation of life under the constant threat of erasure, radical empathy, stomp traces of fascism with precise intent, culture jamming, disruptors on the side of reimagined justice, the orchestration of crashing bricks, how it feels to survive being human in the midst of never before seen crisis such as we are living through right now. These pages bear witness as they break open words and images to make space for our bodies and lives. King Sugi, golden joinery. What does it mean to repair? Compassionate urgency, unlearning, distance and perception, to be still in the still of the crisis, Body, biopower recaptured, the politics of survival is insufficient for the moment. Do not retreat. Document the dance marked by trauma on the grave of respectability. A world on a thread. Survival runs deep as it repeats. We have to break what is breaking us. There are things to say when it comes to critical love. Look at the earth flourish in this crisis. Look at the violence. Take care of the self, of each other. An abolitionist provocation a hedonist's alterity, an anti-oppressive framing. Always there is subtext. Find your pillars of wellness. Be surprised. True love is everywhere. This is liberatory anarchism, agreeing to protect our autonomous bodies and the free love of our communities and our processes of remembering and forgetting and healing and rebuilding. Punk forever. Sweat it out creativity at the imaginary horizon of our possible worlds. I love all of you. Thank you for taking the mic and passing it around. I'm gonna send it to Nick. Nick, what you got? Well, I'm first, I'm clapping. I, speaking of this being a virtual party, I do miss the IRL parties where you could feel the energy and hear everyone clapping. And, um, but this translates so well today because I, I just feel a lot of love and I wanna thank you all again. Um, I, I do want to ask one question and uh, I'll jump right into it. We're kind of talking about education. Well, well actually, uh, Bishop, you mentioned before, uh, it's interesting that everyone involved in your guest critics uh, page and everyone joining us today in some way, shape or form are educators and work with education. And you use the phrase unlearning. Um, my, my main question is that how does being an educator factor into your activism? And without maybe opening a can of worms, uh, what are the obstacles that you see uh, that educational institutions present? And um, how, how, can we, how can we envision a more radical form of education for our youth? I'm actually just, it's open for everyone, but I, I'm thinking of passing that back over to Yolanda first. Thank you, Nick. And you know, when Bishop said unlearn, there's two things that come to mind. I think about the work of my bestie, uh, Dr. Golden Hassan Mohammed, who is working on uh, with, with her friend, partner, Dee Jackson, just this uh, on-site or online curation, I don't know what we call it, 
where uh, folks will come and get the services of black and brown people um, as, as folks take their different journey of unlearning. That's the first thing I thought about. The second thing I thought about was um, the brother who wrote Kanye West's Jesus Walks, I forget his name, but he had a song in the loop. This was a couple of years ago. The new thing is to unlearn everything. And unlearning, abolition, to me, those things mean the same. Because as we are unlearning the racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamic phobic practices, as Beverly Daniels Tatum talks about the smog that we're all breathing in, that that, that is a bit of tearing down. It's, 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 we're not looking for reconstruction. We're looking to tear down and build anew. And that will require that we unlearn the things that we accept as truth, the things that we accept as um, well, it has to go in this order. The things that Regina broke down that we know the capitalist model is that some starve so that others can have a, a table of affluence. And so um, for me specifically in teacher education, when I'm dealing with folks who want to be teachers and who are teachers, it's important that they do what I call this archeology span of the self to dig deep, to excavate all of that, to unlearn. If someone's soul and spirit is not willing to unlearn, we can't really get far. Because then they're just engaging in these professional developments and taking notes and trying new things for the curriculum. I'm talking about getting at the soul of who you are when you are interacting with other human beings in the classroom. And so there has to be that stripping, that unlearning, that abolition so that we can create a new. So I thank you for that because that is the mindset that I come to when I'm doing teaching, I am, in the words of Dr. Bettina Love, we're not trying to reform. Reform hasn't worked for us. It's time to tear down, unlearn, and build anew. That's what the Brooklyn Rail, I feel, invited us to do. Unlearning some of these things and bringing in something new that people can hold onto as they move forward. There were a few other folks too that, um are published in this with us who are not on the mic today all many almost all of whom are educators actually and so my friend Nassim Zarifi who had to leave to go teach at 1 30 but his piece was about anti-blackness at the borderlands of whiteness and it was just so powerful he and I had uh we were gonna write a piece called mistaken for a white guy together because we both get mistaken for white guys all the time um but we but it actually translated into this other thing and it still became about what you just said Yoli in terms of like what does it mean to to crack open, to abolish, to say no, right? And I mean, and I want to throw it to, to Nicole, I think, and to Maris too, because they do this work on the daily in, in educational exactly spaces. But, you know, I teach at CUNY and um, I mean, work at Global Kids and our work is very much about uplifting young people, but I also teach at CUNY and I teach research methods and I spend so much of my time trying to decolonize methodologies at the same time that I have to teach people kind of how to even do it in the first place. So it's this dance that you're doing to try to both bring people in to access language of power and ideas that perhaps they never knew in order to rip them the hell apart and say, no, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. You do it as you, as you damn please. And so the idea of breaking open words and ideas, I mean, that's, that's Deleuze, frankly, but the idea that like, you can say it any way you want. You can spit the truth as you see it and don't let anybody tell you how to do it otherwise. So I don't know, D, Nicole in particular, throw it to Regina, throw it open. What folks think, Demers? Yeah, I'm thinking, so are black girls well, right? Um, when we think about uh, systems of oppression and we think about um, interlocking oppressions and all the different intersections of oppression, um, we have to look at black girls in our schools. Um, and I could think of countless students whose faces I'm seeing right now. Um, and, and the question really is, is are they well? Um, are we only looking at the deficit of, of our students that are black and brown? Are we, are we centering their joy and, and all the good that they bring to the space? Um, I just got off a call uh, with my undergraduate institution and we were talking about you know, the importance of intergenerational conversations and sitting with folks who have been doing this work and what we can learn from them. Um, and so it was really about all of us coming together and really piecing you know, together what it is that has been happening and how do we, what are the mistakes and the pitfalls that we've kind of fallen into in the past and how do we get past that? Because there's so much um, 
micro invalidation that exists in school spaces and uh, things that we really need to interrupt, but we can't do that if we're not in conversation, um, if we're not in constant conversation. And so I think, yeah, the deficit, the, the, the wondering about who is well, um, if black girls are not well, none of us are well. If black women are not well, none of us are well, right? And so, um, you know, that comes from the Kambahi River Collective. They talk about like, if black women are not well, um, then, then we have a problem and we have a problem, you know? And so we really have to start thinking in education about centering black girls um, and their joy and thinking about how we best support them in their healing. Because when we do that, we're good. So, yeah. Nicole, I saw you in, drop something in the chat too. Take the mic. Oh yeah, I did. Demaris just said everything I wanted to say, but yes, by default, if you take girl of black, take care of black girls, everybody else by default will be good. Um, and so I think that keeping who needs to be in the center in the center is super important all the time. Um, always uplifting the voices of people who don't always have the platform to speak for themselves. Um, and I just think I think back to my time at CUNY uh, in Bishop's class. And uh, my research was around, uh, well, my research topic was how can or what personal gains can black youth achieve when their schools divest from white supremacist uh, practices, praxis, and policy. Um, and understanding that like it's everywhere, it's baked into the system and the systems um, of education are systems and they are designed to operate exactly as they do. And those of us who manage to fall through the cracks towards something better are falling through the cracks. Um, they're, not, they're not set up for our success. And mostly and mainly because they don't ever ask us what we need and what we want. And what is and what success looks like for us. So Bishop's idea of like do what you want, say what you want, write how you want, think how you want is like com the complete antithesis of everything you learn in school, which is about conformity and not being a, an independent thinker and not learning to find the answers for yourselves. Um, and so we have to decolonize that process and understand like that it begins with um, young people being respected and. Uh, like uplifted for what they had to say and bring to the table now, like all this, you know, young people are the future malarkey. They are now, they are doing things now. Young people in the snapshots of history have always been doing stuff. They've been leading revolutions. They've been marching, they've been chanting, they've been breaking down systems of oppression since the beginning of time. Young people are the stuff. Um, and people need to ask them what they want to do in school and how school can best serve them uh, to reach the, goals that they have set for themselves um, so they can live self-determined lives at GGE. We talk a lot about, you know, living a self-determined life and what does that mean? How do, how do we um, break down systems and break down obstacles and barriers that, so that people can actually do what they want? And what they want is not prescribed by society and by capitalist society, by white supremacist society, by anybody but themselves. Um, and I think in this time, we have to start to shift because the world is changing. Um, and so our de ideas of like, go to school, become a computer scientist, a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, all those are absolutely fine professions, but you could be a social media influencer and be dope <laughs> and make all the money in the world. So our thoughts about what um, life looks like for people has to evolve as the world evolves. And um, young people need to be at the center of stating what it is that they want and what they need um, from us. And so one thing that I'm just thinking as I'm listening to all of you too is, and I'm gonna throw it, I might throw it to Regina. I keep trying to not drop crazy nicknames all over her because I've known her for my entire millions of years of life. Um, so many of us happen to be formal educators, like, you know, during the day, that's what we do after school, potentially that's what we do, university. But one thing I've always loved about Regina is like the popular political education. The idea that like, you might be walking down the street in uh, DC and she's like, yo, you see that mushroom? Did you know that you can eat that? Did you know what the rejuvenative properties of those things are? It's this popular political education that comes out. And so, you know, I'm thinking about, I don't know. I just, I'm kind of wondering where this is all landing for you. I, in the first instance, like you, the first thing you say about yourself might not be like, you're an educator, but when I look at you and listen to you, I'm like, that's I, I rip books off of your shelf all the time, you know, so I, yeah, I don't know if you if you want the mic at all to talk about kind of community education. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. I, I, um, yeah, I'm, I think um, I went to um, 
as one of the first in my family to graduate from college, I went to grad school, met Bishop, and it was just like, there's no way I should have been in a place of space like this. Um, you know, and so when we think about the unlearning, you know, when we think about, I am very proud of my education, but I also am like, understand that it's an institution that caused a lot of harm and we can hold both of those things at the same time. So I went to, to Carnegie Mellon and I dabbled in some theory because for me, you gotta, you know, you gotta understand the systems in order to uh, strategically place your wrenches in those systems. So they break and oh, isn't that too bad? It broke, let's, let's build something else. And I think a theme that we've heard um, from so many uh, amazing speakers here today, so many amazing humans here today. So I think of myself as um, an applied <laughs> um, person. I happen to have some, some thoughts, some opinions. I happen to have, um, you know, some knowledge experience and I want to share that with everyone in any way that I can. And that's what I do at Food Recovery Network. Um, you know, I work with young people who the concept of Food Recovery Network is um, we shouldn't throw really good food away, which happens every day um, because people are starving, um, people are hungry. Um, and that's, that's part of the, the, the system of if you are so hungry, that means you can't concentrate. That means you don't have energy. And that means you can't fight back against what we're doing to you. Um, and so, and all of those things are happening at Food Recovery Network. And then there are some people, even within that, are like, I just want to do something good for my New Year's today and leave it at that. So there's lots of, there's lots of space there. So I, I, um, I, I think that for me, you know, this is where it does come from the continuous learning. Because you go through school and then you realize you have to turn right back around and, oh, they didn't teach us this, 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 who's they? <laughs> um, and keeping that in, in your control, keeping what you're reading in your control. And the last thing that I have to say around being a practitioner is when we think about the fact that there is more understanding around, we are going to let little black girls experience the same things that we let you know white little girls experience. That is fearful to people. They are afraid of that. That's why we keep getting killed. Um, it's fearful when little boys, little black boys, you know, do these things. It's it's fearful. And so while we are at the same time turning to like, we're going to give them that space to do that. And we actually aren't going to ask for your permission. We're going to let that space happen. That does require that all of us create that buffer around them to let them do that. And that's the brackish, you know, that I think, Bishop, you were talking about um, with Nassim. That, that, that brackish, that, you know, that, that borderland of, you know, that space isn't fully baked yet. It's not, you know, all the highways and the, and the pathways, they're not built yet. Um, and so while we say you can be a little kid and not be afraid, um, and we're not going to try to hook you onto um, the, the system that's already there and you should look like this and you should say it this way, um, you know, it, it does require us all to use our bodies. And for, and for so many people, um, that's gonna be uncomfortable and that's okay because they, they oppress people, we're uncomfortable all the time. Thank you so much. We're gonna throw it back to Nick. I, this the last thing I think I'll say is like, to me, this is like as an academic and as a theory head, I write about ethical intersubjectivity, but what that is about is about standing in solidarity with people with whom it may not be your struggle. So, you know, when I work in teacher ed spaces and things like that, I always have young, uh, like pre-service teachers say to me, like, why do you care about all this? Like they look at me and they, they wanna know why, right? And I'm like, because I need you to stand in solidarity with me and my queer body and protect me the same way I'm trying to protect you. And so like that, you know, that's what it comes down to for me in a fairly basic sense of things. And I like rereading this critics page is just, I love what is uplifted here. Like there's more of us than there are of quote unquote them, whoever the hell that is. Nick, take the mic. Um, yeah, I do. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I, I do want to kind of keep us on track because I know we uh, unfortunately have to wrap up at 2.30 today and, and I want to have enough time for some of the really wonderful questions that I saw come in. Um, I want to, thank you all for joining us today and for sharing your voices and for sharing your texts with the rail 
So thank you, Nicole and Regina and Yolanda and Damaris and Bishop. Thank you to my brilliant colleague, Malvika, for being a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. Um, I want to pick, I love that we're like picking up quotes throughout this. Um, and it, for me in a way is sort of, it's part of that solidarity and it's part of that, that community building, which in my mind is the answer to a lot of these structural problems. Um, we have to work together and we have to be a part of a community where we have solidarity and radical empathy for each other. Um, two, two quick things that just really struck me. Uh, Damaris said, the importance of access to an education that is steeped in history, healing and healthy relationships. I think that is so vital to what uh, we need in the future. And uh, another, another kind of aphorism to take away that uh, was from your text, Bishop, is that fearlessness is the only way to the abundance of joy just past the depth of despair. Um, thank you all again, such beautiful, loving energy. I'm gonna hand the mic now over to Malvika to open it up for questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I just wanna take a minute. I dropped uh, a resource in the chat that came together uh, very spontaneously and very beautifully and collaboratively amongst all of the phenomenal humans on this panel in our pre-check. Um, so this is a resource list a little different than the community resource list we usually share. And this is one specifically of like all of these amazing partner organizations or just like hyping people doing the good work uh, that I've been dropping in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, click on that, that'll be available whenever you'd like. Um, and yeah, we have some beautiful questions coming in. Our first one, I'm so happy to say, comes from our very own production assistant, Anya Bernstein. So Anya, passing the mic over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Malvika. Thank you, everyone, for your words. Um, I wanted to ask about um, this idea of like the the violence of the ivory tower, um, thinking about, you've already started touching on first the, like the role of being an educator and an activist and like the importance of education and, and all its different forms inside and outside the classroom. Um, and then uh, thinking about the, the tension of being an educator in higher education, you know, working with these, you know, radical ideas of unlearning um, and thinking about how we're at a crossroads for higher education. I'm specifically uh, drawn to right now the, the youth DSA movement at um, Columbia Barnard. You know, there's a tuition strike going on, um, which is amazing. Like seeing that, I never even considered that as a possibility. Um, and so I think that's, that's a huge step in, in a direction towards, you know, at least like reckoning, demanding more of the university. And I wanted to know, you know, what, what your ideal future is for, for higher education, you know, what steps, you know, do you, do you see, um, or what, what do you think is possible for, for reckoning with that, that violence of the ivory tower um, within and without, um, like being part of and being outside of um, that space? So I'm gonna, I'll grab the mic, um, and then I, we should throw it back around to folks. Um, millions of things are flooding me kind of to this question. I turned around and grabbed off of my shelf though, um, this piece that was published in the 70s, this is about free education at CUNY. Um, and it was about the continuation of the free university of New York. And so when I think about the insipid nature of capitalism and higher ed, like what does it mean? And this is, Regina was talking about this and she was talking about it, but like breaking capitalist, yeah, um, like racialized capitalist structures before, like what does it mean to create other spaces, right? So many of us have probably been in, in unconferencing spaces or things of that nature. And so of course there's these kind of small spaces that we can uh, transgress. Although, you know, even the word transgress gives me pause because it means like that they hold the power in the center and screw that idea. Um, but there's a, there's a few ways through I think here. So, you know, when I teach research methods, like I said, like so much of it is, even when I teach, Sometimes the people who have net, who have a lot of fear when they walk into research, people always say to me on day one, I'm real scared of this class. Um, and they always leave not being scared anymore, but which is I think a, a gift I can give them. Um, 
is, you know, this old idea, research methods in the social sciences is a very white man science. And anybody who's taken my class has heard me say, like, I'm teaching you the white man science on some level because I am asked to, right? When I did my dissertation at the University of Pittsburgh, I tried to write a 21 chapter rhizomatic deluso guitarian text. And I got a pretty loud clap back from higher ed about that. And they were like, nah, this is social sciences. You need five sections that are an introduction, a literature review, your methods, your findings, and you're out. And I was like, this is so boring. It's so oppressive. And of course I did it. Cause you know, you got to get those letters or whatever after your name, but I immediately like kind of set to the work of undoing that. And so that, like even the second book I wrote is very much the book that should have been the first one probably. So on some level, I think it's about freeing ourselves from thinking that we have to hold on to these kind of old ideas of how you write and why you write and when you write. And um, Donna Alverman, who, who blurbed the, my book, um, who is an incredible OG white woman doing phenomenal um, education work in Georgia actually too, she told me that she was the lead dissertation advisor for a dissertation that had no words that was fully a performance piece. And she's, I don't know how old she is now and like shout out to this, her seventies or something, but you know, she was, she was pushing the envelope um, in an important, yeah, domestic can't wait for that to happen. Um, trying to not watch the chat cause it's blowing up, but you know, so what does it mean to, to do it differently, right? What, to what Nicole said earlier, what does it mean to write differently, speak differently, get poetic as hell with all of it. Um, so that's one thing. I also think about, so Yolanda and I sat down in 2015, 2016, um, and we published a conversation together called Learning Through Dialogue. It's my pinned tw uh, tweet on Twitter because it's one of my most favorite things I ever did. And that conversation, and Yoli, you know I'm about to throw you the mic. You know, we talk about the golden handcuffs in higher ed. What does it mean to get a doctorate so that you can become a <clears throat> professor, so that you can be at <clears throat> like higher ed and <clears throat> Ivory Tower and the Ivy League and all these things and to what end and for what purpose. And so I just keep thinking about like, how can we flip all this over? And even inviting Yoli to this, to publish in this was fun for me. Cause I know that higher ed wants to ask her to always publish in top tier, you know, high index peer review, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yo, let's go write somewhere else. Let's keep writing in other places. Yolanda, what you got? Oh man, Bishop, it's, you're always hard to follow. Let me just say this. I want to offer this text by K. Wayne Yang a third university is possible. That should be at the top of everyone's reading list. Just in short, he takes a look at technology and us uh, kind of imagining ourselves or realizing that we're a bit uh, of cyborgs in this moment, but how can we use technology, AKA Zoom spaces to decolonize the academy, to decolonize our minds and decolonize thinking. So K. Yang Wang's A Third University is Possible is what I would offer uh, Anya first and foremost. And everything that Bishop said, yeah, you know, I was in corporate for 13 years. There's golden handcuffs there. Uh, the academy, the tenure is the golden handcuffs. And if you don't know who you are going in, you will certainly not know who the hell you are coming out. And it is a space when Bishop and I were talking about, you know, this idea of the university, you know, pimping, you know, it's, it's a, it's a almost a mutually pimping relationship that goes on to some extent, right? Because, um, we use the universities or we use the institutions to kind of pull ourselves forward. And then depending on the work that we do, they use us as well. So it's a mutually kind of pimping situation. Now, having said that, knowing who you are as someone focused on freedom, liberation, um, uh, setting the, yourself and the world free, you can do important work within those spaces. And you know, I, I, I give a shout out to the, the institution that I'm in that, um, you know, there are moments, but I pretty much do the work that I need to do around racial literacy. And this is who I am. It was before I, I was this way before tenure. I'm this way after tenure. So I want, what I want to say, Anya and everyone is, we know the good work that can be done through the porch or on the porch of the university. You have to know who you are or you will lose yourself because institutions come in wanting to brand you in a particular way. You've got to figure out how to navigate that. And the beautiful thing is there's enough resources to figure it out. A third university is possible.
I wonder if any of the rest of our guests want to jump on that. I mean, Regina was, you know, kind of throwing down about our experience at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and I'll never forget, and it's actually in the piece of Yoli, in which I talk about the Foucault professor who just kept telling everyone they were wrong. And I was like, how, is, how are you teaching Foucault? Um, but then, you know, and D, you're in it right now. And Nicole, you know, you just graduated. And so, I mean, not that long ago. So I don't know. I'm just kind of curious how this question is landing for y'all. Yeah. Um, I think I came here very resistant to the university. Um, you know, I went to Teachers College. And if it weren't for folks like Yoli, and Chris Emden um, that really created the space for, to, for me to be seen and for me to be heard, I probably wouldn't have finished there, um, you know? And so I think that it's very important that in these spaces, we, we figure out who we are and, and really try to stay true to that. And part of the reason why I picked, um, or any of the institutions that I picked to go to school at, I was like, I gotta work with a black woman. Um, and I have to, uh, you know, a black woman has to lead me through this journey because they, I need to know how to navigate this space as a black woman intact and, and coming out of this space whole, right? And so my mentorship is incredible. Um, I have Yoli, I have Dr. Muhammad, I have Dr. Love, I have all these amazing black women and co-conspirators who are also doing the work. I have you, Bishop, you know, and so having folks who help me to navigate the space um has been so very helpful and those are things that some of my peers don't have you know and so I'm like you need to talk to this person or you, maybe you should connect with this person because part of doing the work in the academy is finding a collective is finding your people and and pushing through and so um you know part of what I'm encouraged to do and like I mentioned earlier is like to do the work that I want to do and the work that I want to do centers black people point blank period the end Right. And so, yes, I have to get tenure. And yes, I know I have to play that game and dance. Um, but I also, you know, am interested in like Afrofuturism and, and all the different things that really help us to get beyond the spaces that we're in. And so I think that, yeah, it's, it's about finding your people. It's about finding your people and it's about allowing them to help you shape what it is that you need to do in order to navigate the space. Because so much can be done here and so much is being done here. Um, so I'm excited. I can't wait for you to be everybody's professor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect I place think, to jump. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Mavika. I just will add quickly that um, I wrestle with and struggle with sometimes like the institutionalization and professionalization of things, um, especially things that are like have indigenous roots and things that come from like community and come from people. So like people are always like, well, where can I get a degree in restorative practice? Oh, you can't, you can't, because it don't exist because that's people's stuff. And like, you know, it's from the community and it's how people are in relationship with others um, or professionalizing youth work, which is like a, a double-edged sword. You know, we want folks to earn a, um, a, a good wage. We want people to be, to have pathways of success. We want people to be able to climb a ladder, so to speak, or to, to provide for their families doing the work that they love. But also like people's aunties and people's cousins and people's uh, friends who have been formerly incarcerated that are just dope with young people. Like we cut off um, access to so many things for people when we institutionalize them and when we professionalize them um, not to say that there is not a need for that and a reason for it and I understand it but it's part of the system that also keeps purposefully keeps people out and purposefully locks people away um, and most of the time those are the people that are the dopest and the people that are the best at it and the people that just genuinely have the knack and the skill and the heart and the community connections to do those things so that's kind of like my ongoing struggle. It took me 95 million years after I graduated from undergrad to go back to grad school at the absolute uh, insistence of my mother. I was like, oh, let me just do this one good thing for her. <laughs> um, yes, gatekeeping, absolutely. So Damatla, gatekeeping, yes. Um, sorry, my peoples are in here. Uh, mm -hmm. That's all. No, that's perfect. Um, I wanna jump in really quickly. This is resonating so deeply with me, both um, in terms of like other guests we've had on and like words of wisdom people have shared, but everything you're saying and everything that has been said, uh, especially about like the good work that can be done on the porch of the university, but um, is resonating with me really, really deeply. Uh, 
we had like an artist named Turquoise Dyson who I really admire on a couple months ago and she said something that just like screwed my head on right she was like you can go to Yale if you want but Yale's not going to love you like you can't be expecting institutions to provide for you what you know what you get when you know where you're embedded and like if you're set up the right way already in the spaces where you're embedded knowing the community you have then like you can go to Yale you know and she described going to Yale herself and she was like I just went and I was seeing what they were doing and she wasn't traumatized because she was like she just felt like she was there watching like what other people were doing in their house for two years but she didn't ever feel like she was supposed to be welcomed in and you know it's like it's it's heartbreaking but it's not that heartbreaking if you have someplace else you're already good mm -hmm. um which is you know not to make this about me but that was really big for my development this year um to our next question. Our next question comes from the lovely Henry, uh, who you can turn on your mic now. Let me find them. There we go. Thank you so much, Malvika. And thank you so much, Bishop, and all the contributors from September Critics page for joining us again. Um, I have a question for Regina. Um, obviously, it's been a couple of months since the whole critics page came out. Um, and I would love it if you could speak a bit about um, how your piece holds up and how as job insecurity, unemployment and the kind of devastating uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in are compounding, um, I don't know, the waste in our culture and food waste and food insecurity. I mean, every day one comes across more and more horrifying statistics. Um, I came across this article that I can put in the chat, which really just, um, it just, it kind of brings it all home. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk about how COVID, especially in the last few months has affected this and if there's been any gestures to kind of um, change our kind of approach to that and to change like the economic cultural approaches to that. Henry, thank you so much for that question. And I'd love to see that, that article. Um, so the fact is right now we have about 54 million people who are food insecure in this country. And if that's a term that's unfamiliar for some folks, what food insecurity means is that, um, you know, you, you might've had breakfast this morning, but you literally have no idea if you're gonna have lunch. You literally have no idea if you're gonna have dinner and you don't know if you're gonna have breakfast the next day. You don't have enough resources in, in your life at that moment um, to secure food. That's what food insecurity is. And it happens to all kinds of people across this country, across the world for a lot of reasons, many of which are outside of our control because of the system we have built. Before the pandemic, there was about, in, in the United States, uh, 38 million people who were food insecure. And the year before that, it was about 38 million people. And the year before that, it was about you know, 34 million people. This, the number has always been very staggering. And the pandemic, um, with, you know, we see about a million people every, every week are applying for um, unemployment many people who have never had to do this before. So I think for me too, when, I, when we think about, you know, uh, systems and we think about circularity, you know, when we think about a whole pie that people have to make decisions with, um, the resources that they have, people are deciding, okay, rent, medication, childcare, or food. And what you can do with your resources literally changes at any one moment. Um, and so we see unemployment um, has skyrocketed because um, of a lot of the, the positions that we've lost are, you know, in, in, in places, restaurant businesses, um, you know, uh, retail um, that were already pretty fragile to begin with. And so the pandemic has only exacerbated what was a, a pretty fragile situation to, to begin with. Um, I, I feel like um, for me with Congress, um, hemming and hawing and, you know, put, put a period here, put a comma there around whether or not they should give money to people who are hungry right now um, 
it, we're asking people to make decisions in a situation that they have never found themselves in. And so that's a problem um, because they just don't have that. Not only do they not have the empathy, they don't have the radical empathy. Um, and so that's why we continue to see the crisis that, that, that um, has existed. The, the, the beautiful part um, you know, that I think some of the things that have been highlighted today are other economies that are happening to feed people. Um, so in New York, um, there's this beautiful thing called the Fridge, which our uh, community members are putting out refrigerators so people can go and get food where they need it, when they need it. And so this is food with dignity and with respect. Um, you know, my organization, um, now that a lot of brick and mortar has closed down, we're going to farm fields and gathering food there because about 10 million tons of food every year was tilled under, you know, even before the pandemic. So there is food um, and, it's, and it's just the will of, of people like us here on this conversation that say, I can take an hour and go grab some of that food and bring it to my neighbors because, you know, the capitalist system will say, you know, your time is going to come at some point. You're going to get sick. You're going to lose your house because you got sick. That's what we say. That's what we say. Um, so there's a lot of hard moments, um, Henry, that we've seen, but there's also some really beautiful, shiny moments around distributing food. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I wish we could continue uh, and maybe like spend the day or the week, um, but it, Unfortunately, time waits for no Zoom. So I'd love to take this opportunity to sort of transition um, to our next step. So at Rail, we, uh, we have a tradition usually of ending our lunches with a poem. And one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that since physical distance has been less of a barrier, we get to invite actual living poets to share their work with us. And that's been very special. But today we are extra, extra lucky to already have some poets in the house. And here to read for us today is poetry enthusiast and poet, Regina Anderson. Um, so Regina, the mic is yours. Thanks, thanks everyone so much. And I wanted to circle back to what, how I started the conversation around you know, poetry is a conversation, it's a practice. And what I love when I, when I read poetry is to ask other people to read the same poem, read it to me, how do you say it? Um, and so again, like so many of the topics um, that we heard today, um, let's talk about it. Let's ask the, the questions. Let's ask the questions over and over and over. Um, it, is, it is our practice. So this, this poem is by Georgia Douglas Johnson, um, a, a, an amazing poet from the Harlem Renaissance. I just found out when Bishop and I were doing some conversations around poetry last night um, that um, uh, Georgia lived in Washington DC where I happen to live and so now I'm gonna go visit her house um, because it was um, a place and a space where lots of conversations like this would happen during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, the poem that I'm going to read is called Common Dust and again, this is Georgia Douglas Johnson. And who shall separate the dust? What later shall we be? whose keen discerning eye will scan and solve the mystery. The high, the low, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the red, in all the chromatique between, of whom shall it be said? Here lies the dust of Africa, here are the sons of Rome, here lies the one unlabeled, the world at large his home. Can one separate the dust? Will mankind lie apart when life has settled back again, the same as from the start? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you as well to Bishop. Thank you, Damaris. Thank you, Yoli. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in today. I'm going to attempt to do something kind of technologically beyond me. So everyone hold your breath. All right, have we done it? We've done it, okay. Um, I thought what I needed from this conversation is to have everyone's IG, Twitter handles, and uh, organizational affiliations, just so we knew. And then to have the list of every sort of organization, every fundraiser mentioned, every project kind of listed out. So I'm just gonna keep this on the screen as I say our exiting greeting for a little bit. And if you want, you can like jot something down. Um, is the screen sharing all right? Okay, cool. All right, all right, so we're ready to go. Um, so thank you all so much. This October marks the Rails 20th anniversary and we'll be celebrating all the way into 2021. Please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent like Common Ground, the new social environment lunchtime series, 
um, and the We the Immigrants Project. Every amount matters to us. Our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors and check out the chat for more information or ask one of our team. Um, someone will drop a link, can't be me doing too much. And uh, please join us again tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation celebrating the life of artist Ron Gorchov, featuring Yevgenia Baras, Lisa Corin Davis, Susan Creel, Odili Donald Odita, uh, Joachim Pissero, Ray Smith, and Robert Storr, and moderated by our very own publisher, Bong H. Bui. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Lucia Hinosa and Veit Baikates. That will be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Um, so you should be now able to turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. I'm going to close this so that I can put that setting on. One sec. And I, I echo I echo those thanks again and again. Um, this has just been such a wonderful event today. And I really feel the love and that sense of community and solidarity. So. Thank you all for the work that you do, that you continue to do. Um, I really encourage everyone to take a look back at the chat. If you, uh, there's three little dots and there's a button that says save chat. Um, I encourage everyone to save it because there's been a lot of really great links and other organizations that you can support. Um, and support's not always money. Support is volunteering, it's spreading the word. And um, I encourage everyone to spread the love. So thank you again. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, everyone. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grandma. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Bishop. Such a so great today. Thank you, Bishop. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Bishop oh, is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.